Hello and welcome to the Iowa Learning Farms virtual field today, field day today. I'm Liz Ripley. I'm the Conservation and Cover Crop Outreach Specialist with Iowa Learning Farms. A little bit about us. We are based on campus at Iowa State University and we're established in 2004. Our goal is to build a culture of conservation, working with farmers, landowners, researchers to implement practices that improve water quality and soil health while remaining profitable. And this is all made possible through our partners, which include the Iowa Department of Ag and Land Stewardship, the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service, Iowa State University Extension and Outreach, the Leopold Center for Sustainable Agriculture, our Iowa Department of Natural Resources, US EPA Section 319, our Conservation Districts of Iowa, the Iowa Farm Bureau, Practical Farmers of Iowa, GrowMark, the Iowa Agriculture Water Alliance, Iowa Corn, and the Iowa Nutrient Research Center, as well as the Sea Change Project here on campus. So again, thank you for joining us today. If at any time you have questions for our presenters today, you are welcome to submit those to me in the chat or following the video, you'll be able to unmute and ask your questions directly. But in the meantime, I just ask that you keep your cameras off and muted while we head to the field here momentarily so everyone gets a chance to experience this amazing ecosystem engineer. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our speakers that will be joining us after the video. They include Dr. Billy Beck, an assistant professor and extension forestry specialist at Iowa State University, and Andrew Rupiper, who is a graduate research assistant in the Natural Resources, Ecology, and Management Department here at Iowa State. So let's head on out and explore these beaver dams. And at my door in under 60 minutes. Hi, I'm Billy Beck, Extension Forestry Specialist with Iowa State University Extension and Outreach and Assistant Professor in the Department of Natural Resource Ecology and Management at Iowa State University. Today we're out at the beautiful Smeltzer Farm, which is a part of the Iowa Learning Farms. We're going to highlight a study today that's fairly unique in the region, looking at a potentially free in-stream conservation practice that deals with water quality and also wood and biology. Here in Iowa, in terms of sediment nutrient loading, we have a pretty good grasp on the performance of our edge of field practices and infield practices as far as attenuating nutrients and sediment. However, we really don't have a good grasp on the channel itself. And the channel, according to the literature more and more, has an incredibly important role in attenuating nutrients and sediment and impacting our annual watershed sediment and nutrient loads. But in Iowa, because of a range of reasons that you can see some of these behind me, we've lost the functionality of the channel to perform a lot of those nutrient and sediment removal processes. We've straightened our streams, we've removed riparian vegetation along our waterways, removed in channel wood, uh, added, uh, artificial drainage to the landscape, all facts which we'll be touching on today really to play a significant role in attenuating uh, nutrients and in fact has uh, maybe moved the channel to an important source of nutrients and sediments uh, exiting our watersheds. So today we're going to be kind of exploring uh, what if a uh, free conservation practice that is kind of contentious uh, may have an impact, a positive or negative impact, uh, on our stream nutrient and sediment loads and that being beaver dams. Um, this study, funded by the Iowa Nutrient Research Center, is looking to do two main objectives. We really want to quantify the hydrologic impacts of beaver dams. So how do they affect flow? How do they affect water retention? How do they affect riparian groundwater table? Also, we want to see if we can quantify their impact on nutrients and sediment. Are they trapping nutrients and sediment? Are they providing opportunities for nitrogen removal, for example? So today here at Smelter Farm, we're going to be um, doing a case study on one of our um, study dams in this beaver dam study and highlighting one of our grad students' uh, very extensive efforts uh, to answer these questions. And uh, my grad student and I and our whole team here, we kind of do realize uh, the challenges of um, promoting or um, keeping beaver dams in the landscape when it's, you have an agricultural system and a highly modified system. And we're not really trying to promote dams or discourage dams. This study is really looking at, can we get some numbers on their performance and seeing what impact, if any, they're having on nutrients, sediment, and hydrology. 
Hi there, we're at the Ann Smeltzer Charitable Trust Farm today. I'm Andrew Rupiper, graduate student in Dr. Billy Beck's lab. Today we're looking at a series of beaver dams. These beaver dams provide a number of services that we're going to explore further. One of the things I want to point out right away is just the stark difference in the stream channel above and below a beaver dam. We're going to see when we get to a larger beaver dam, the, the differences are much more pronounced. However, we really want to make sure we understand that these are going to be a, in a relationship between human use of the landscape as well as what the beavers are looking for. Beavers are producing these dams and pools simply as a way to stay safe and find food resources. Beavers were hunted almost to extinction in the state of Iowa in the early 1900s. Eventually they've recovered with some reintroduction efforts. Along the way we've ran into various conflicts, uh, but we're focusing primarily today on how they, they impact the waterways, both the impaired waterways, such as these channelized reaches, and we'll address some of the other waterways that beavers inhabit in the state. One of the things we really wanted to emphasize about the system we're working in, and the system that's very common across Iowa, is this incised stream channel. And what I mean by incised is, you can notice the extreme height difference between the top of the bank or the start of the floodplain and the channel bed itself. And that has a lot of implications for water quality and quantity. Uh, and a lot of our systems in Iowa are what we call disconnected. And what I mean by that is only the largest flow events in this kind of situation make it out onto the floodplain. As we know, uh, when channels emerge out under their floodplain, a lot of good things happen for nutrient and sediment attenuation long term. So that's one thing we really need to think about, and Andrew's going to touch on a lot, is how do these dams operate in this incredibly incised system when a lot of the flow is being contained in that system and we have an incredible um, stream power um, coming through these channels and their impacts on the dams themselves. So really unique and I think that's what's really novel about this study is this is a very um, one of the first studies we believe that looks at beaver dams in this very unique altered system. And right here just in general there's a lot of great talking points um, that Andrew's going to touch on right now. Thanks, Billy. So yeah, like Billy said, there's a lot of research that's been done about what goes on behind beaver dams, but it generally takes place out west or up in Canada, places that we see these large traditional beaver meadows formed. We have this very unique landscape here in Iowa in that our channels are incised. A relatively small beaver dam, only two or three feet tall, can back up thousands of gallons of water, raising the stage of the stream so that other organisms like fishes, amphibians, you get deer and things moving through. A lot of birds of uh, concern in the state of Iowa, shorebirds and the like, will utilize this as some habitat. The really cool thing is to come here in the summertime when everything's dry, it's a drought, all the streams are dried up, and you still have these massive pools of water, plants, all kinds of critters running around. One of the ways that we decide what stretches of river are dammed versus not, uh, we'll look at things like biofilms on the surface, plants that are growing, algae if it's staying in place, mats of those types of organisms only exist in stretches of the river that are slowed by a beaver dam. The water that transits from one end to a beaver pool to the other moves much slower than water in the stream either above or below that, that structure. Anytime you slow the water down, all of the natural processes have time to interact with the things that we're concerned about. Sediment gets deposited in place and it grades up building the stream bed nutrients get processed by things like microbes and plants that are utilizing nitrate, phosphorus, and the like. Hopefully beavers can provide some relatively free, continually maintained structures to return some of those nutrients back to the landscape and keep them within the cycle, rather than sending them downstream to the Mississippi River, the Gulf eventually, and causing problems there. We're here at the primary dam at the Smelter Trust Farm. Beavers tend to build a primary dam and then some uh, secondary dams to extend the pool as needed. This dam is providing a huge amount of ecosystem services, all free of charge. The dam itself is trapping significant amounts of sediment. We estimate somewhere in the range of 200,000 kilograms in this dam alone when compared to non-dam reaches. What does that mean? That's 20 dump truck loads, roughly, of this fine, phosphorus-rich sediment that's being trapped behind the dam. The beavers are creating these large dams to provide them areas to move in and out of the system. They don't walk well over land, so they prefer to swim in the water. In areas like this, they've extended their dam all the way from bank to bank, creating a very wide channel in what's normally a very incised, very channelized waterway. They also utilize a number of materials when building their dam, not just sticks. 
they're eating the outside, the cambium of a, of a log or stick to get the nutrients, and then they're left with this great building material. They place the large materials downstream to provide structure, and then they'll interweave a number of things into the dam to make a very dense, very non-porous uh, structure. A lot of people think of dams as filters, when in reality, they're a very rigid structure that really only lets water over the top when rain events happen. Behind me, you'll see extending back into the willow trees, there are a number of interwoven dams with the bank. Uh, they've done that to extend that pool both laterally and up and downstream. We see evidence of a lot of the biological processes that we really hope to invoke here in the Iowa Stream channels. We have all kinds of really effluent sediments uh, churning up all these microbes that are denitrifying. Uh, we're trapping that sediment that we're concerned is eroding from the banks in our, our farm fields, locking it in place. This dam has been here for roughly 10 or 15 years. These aren't permanent structures in the state of Iowa. Our hydrology will remove them every now and then, but a lot of the legacy will stay in place. Those materials that were graded into the bed, a lot of times will be integrated into the system, as well as all of the nitrate removal uh, benefits that we've taken across the range of that dam's lifetime. Beaver dams are highly complex. They're made up of a lot of different materials found in the local landscape. Beavers will use things like grasses, sedges, root masses, integrate that in with a lot of the fine sediments that they're dredging up from the bottom of their pool, patting it in place each night to create a perfect watertight structure that they can exist behind. In addition, they'll start to use things like cobbles, boulders, rolling them up to the top of the dam to really anchor it in place. Every once in a while, we see beavers utilizing corn stalks. A lot of times that's just the proximity to the cornfield uh, when the beavers are in the channel. They're going to use whatever is readily available. You can put some distance between the beaver dam and your cornfield. You might not have that negative effect. Willows are the preferred food. If you see behind me here, we have all kinds of willows in this area. The Smelter Trust Farm has been intentional about leaving beaver dams in place. They like to see the natural action of the beavers, the plants, the trees, and everything working in concert. We get all kinds of little critters out here that are relatively rare, endangered in some cases, simply because these dams exist. They're providing all kinds of services just by their existence and trapping of the stream water. They're slowing the water. They're allowing all those processes to act upon the water and any sort of excess nutrients that might be bound within. They're also trapping significant amounts of sediment. We spend a lot of time and a lot of undergraduate hours training and teaching how to wander through these fine, highly effluent, delicious nitrate reducing sediments. We've had about 30 different students out at our various sites learning things about water quality, hydrology, the ecosystem services that are provided. It's a really fun time to have them out with us. Being the trust farm smelter, the smelter area here is able to kind of experiment. That being said, there are a lot of opportunities across the state, especially up on the Des Moines lobe, where we have a really unique set of soil and water circumstances, relatively young landscape that could put uh, beavers to work and potentially reducing some of the loss of that soil as well as processing nitrate. Even if you're not interested in those services, you have all kinds of animals that are gonna show up at your, uh, at your beaver dam pool and, and share in the, the water resource, especially in that droughty summertime. Generally, when we're looking at reducing nitrate, we need three conditions to exist. We need low oxygen, which is provided in the base of a five foot, six foot deep beaver pool. We need organic matter. We need carbon, all kinds of it available here. We also need residence time. If those other two conditions are present, but the water is just moving through at a rapid rate, the water doesn't have time to interact with these processes. Putting a beaver dam in place slows the water, allows that carbon to condense and be saturated in an area of low oxygen, and those microbes just get to work. We see pretty significant reductions from above a chain of beaver dams to below the chain of beaver dams, simply taking small grab samples of water and analyzing them for nitrate conditions. We also see significant reductions in things like just mobile sediments, which generally are going to contain phosphorus in, in high quantities. I hope you've seen today that these animals and the structures they create are incredibly fascinating and incredibly complex. 
And again, our goal of this study is to simply get uh, numbers on their impact. We're not saying to encourage them or discourage them, but it is our hope to see that maybe when placed in the right spot on the agricultural enterprise, they could act more of an asset than a nuisance. If you'd like more information on this study, um, or if you've got dams on your property you'd like us to come out and monitor, please contact Andrew Rupiper, graduate student at Iowa State University. Um, and with that, I'll just go back to my usually faculty MO and I'll have Andrew get in the stream while I chill up here and, and get my lunch sandwich. So. Up with the truck. All right. Well, again, feel free to type in questions at any point. Uh, you can submit those to me. We hope you enjoy that maybe a little more fun aspect of this video. And uh, I know Billy and Andrew wanted to share a little bit more information from their research on these sites. Yeah, thanks again, Liz, and thanks everybody for tuning in. I'm uh, gonna briefly share just a couple insights. Billy was already asked a question about how, how do we go about quantifying and measuring these sediments? I think that's a good place to start. So we really, it's manual. We hop in the stream, uh, we measure literally how much sediment is degraded there. I've got a little image here that can maybe help us out. So a lot of what we do is happening along the stream continuum. We have dams kind of across the landscape. Uh, we're taking water samples and all sorts of things up and down the stream channel. On the left side of my screen here, it's a little bit difficult to see potentially, but uh, during the video, you saw me probing down the metal rod. What we do is we feel down until we feel the top of that sediment. We continue pressing down until we feel the bottom of that sediment. Usually it's that interface with kind of sand and gravel. And we take that as a measurement. We do that across a, a stream transect up and down the, the pool. And then we always, as scientists, want to compare to something. So we go way up above the, the reach of the stream where the beaver dams aren't impacting the landscape. We do the same thing there. So we're able to kind of look at both on like a per meter basis, so an area, how much uh, this sediment has degraded. And then we also take some of that sediment back to the lab, uh, measure things like bulk density, how much phosphorus is present within it. So we can kind of back calculate uh, how much is trapped by the beaver dam. A lot of those things, the, the sediments themselves are very mobile. So they're not gonna be permanently locked in place for the most part. When the spring event comes, it might be washed back downstream, but holding it in place there's uh, potentially gonna allow some of those uh, things to interact with it. I guess the other thing to show pretty quickly, I talked a little bit about uh, how the, the stream channels are just full of water during the spring. Uh, so this is a perfect, this is our study dam in the spring of 2022. Uh, we thought it was a great example of a dam. So we set up all sorts of sensors and equipment and things to monitor it. Came back a day later and it was gone. So a small rain event over a relatively large watershed can drive a lot of power and move these dams out of the way. Beavers were fortunate enough to be able to build a dam elsewhere. But those are just kind of two, two quick topics that I noticed some questions about. It happens every time. Yeah. So a few other questions have come in. Um, so related to that, um, you talked about rule of thumb for calculating sediment collection. But what do you think is the best way to get people around Iowa to embrace beavers? Um, is NRCS involved? They noted that there is a conservation practice 643 restoration of rare or declining natural communities uh, that is being used out west for these types of projects. Billy, I'll let you try to kind of opine on some of the NRCS. I, I, in my graduate level, I kind of stay in the, in the science <laughs> and less in the policy. Uh, but generally speaking, um, I try to encourage people to give it a shot. Uh, Beaver Dam is fully constructed and paid for by the beavers. You have some trees, you have a stream, they're going to go to work. Uh, a lot of the benefits are kind of secondary. It depends on what you're interested in. I happen to like birds and amphibians and things, so I benefit in that way by having a beaver dam right behind my house. Others that are more interested in kind of some of the more practical nutrient removal and things, well, should see some benefits uh, from that standpoint. 
if nothing else, they're just kind of neat to go sit by. Uh, it's a unique landscape feature that promotes all kinds of cool plants and animals. Beyond that, uh, culturally, we're kind of shifting in Iowa a little bit away from trapping. It was very popular when I was growing up you know, 30 years ago. Uh, it's going to fall off over time with market prices reduced uh, and just generally speaking, less people are uh, trapping. So we see an increase in some of their population, which also can lead to increase in conflict. Uh, so we, we try to say, if you run into a conflict with a beaver, give me a call first. Give me a chance to do something about it from a positive aspect. Uh, there's all kinds of wildlife people that are moving around or do some rehabilitation for the area. Uh, but I'll let Billy, uh, if he has an opinion or thoughts about NRCS, I don't know that it's a practice in the state of Iowa. But Yeah, great points, Andrew. I, I totally agree about the cultural aspect. And I think Andrew stated this before is like, we're really not saying put these everywhere. Yeah, we're again we're going back we're just looking at numbers what impact if anything do they have good or bad um but it would be great if put in the right place and we get it conflicts do exist around infrastructure in the floodplain and around bridges and things like that but when they're placed in the right place um i think they could they have potential to, to do a lot of good um as far as the nrcs practice i was not familiar with that um i usually call the usda service center in my county to keep up with programs uh, just because they're ever changing and can be complex. I will say that the US Fish and Wildlife Service has a program. And again, I don't know what the status of this, but I've seen and we've been on site where they've installed beaver dam analogs, which are basically fake beaver dams. And honestly, they're I, I'm not saying this as being critical. They're actually kind of underwhelming when you see them. But uh, be, even though they're small stature, they do a lot of good. And as opposed to the dams that um, Andrew was just showing that are just like solid structures of almost art form of bio and um, dead wood and living material we've woven together, these are porous. So they're almost like filters. So they have a little bit different of effect than uh, a natural beaver dam. And what they've been really used for um, that we saw, we toured was grade control. So we talked about incision. Uh, those basically back up coarse material to stop the bed from down cutting and even encourage a little bit of bed aggregation. So uh, great question. If anybody from NRCS is on here, I, I am not aware of that, that, that uh, the NRCS program. And we had had a couple of questions about analog beaver dams. So thank you for answering that question. Uh, so there's a question here, is there concern for stream bank destabilization from beavers burrowing? Yeah, we see, generally speaking, in the state of Iowa, beavers don't create those natural lodges that you see out west uh, in kind of your prototypical beaver meadow. Uh, so beavers do, they, they drill right into the side of the bank. Uh, generally speaking, they're doing that a little ways away from the dam itself, uh, just like their lodge wouldn't be directly on the dam. Uh, I would I would almost kind of turn the question a bit and say, rather than is the burrowing causing bank issues, the dam itself can. Uh, generally, the weak point of the dam is where it's tied into that bank. Beavers can't like drive piles in like we can and the bridges and things. So it provides kind of a weak point. So a dam will generally fail on that edge and cause some pretty significant erosion uh, along the one edge of that dam. Now, it's kind of balanced by the pool that's still going to be stable on the other side of it. But uh, we we don't specifically look a lot at the processes happening upstream uh, as far as like bank stabilization, uh, but anytime you back up a bunch of water, you saturate that bank, you can drive some uh, different erosional processes than just the river ripping through itself. Yeah, that's a good point. I'll add that, <clears throat> like Andrew had mentioned, these things are can be quite ephemeral in our incised systems. So we've got a lot of water moving through. It's all contained in the channel. Um, they could easily be damaged. So what happens when you've got saturated conditions and a, a high stage over time, that water will seep into the banks and you get a rapid release and a rapid, rapid drawdown. Those banks are highly unstable and that pressure differential whoosh, could lead to some bank sloughing. But honestly, that's very localized. And I think the overall effect of the dams in the watershed and in the reach uh, do a, a positive for um, kind of tapering the peaks off our, off our hydrographs and um, reducing bank erosion. So it's kind of a thing of scale, localized versus big picture. And Andrew made another good point. It's like those dams, even when they fail, like they do tend to cut around the edges. That's a new meander that's being started. And again, this we agree, this is contentious in, in our state, but 
Meandering reduces stream slope and does a lot of good things for water quantity and erosion and things like that. So, so question here, uh, clarifying water quality changes. Have you seen that water quality has improved greatly downstream from these dams, but not so much at the site of the dam? Yeah, somebody stole my slide. So that's a perfect assessment. Uh, these dams are generally in kind of chains, right? Uh, smelter site that we uh, filmed this video at had about three dams, uh, sometimes five, depending on how excited the beavers are to work. Out at Catton Branch, kind of our opposing, more natural site, they have 15, 20, sometimes 25 dams in a, about a mile reach of stream. The dam itself, if you just look directly above and below, you're probably not going to be able to perceive a big difference in the concentration of nitrate, for example. Uh, phosphorus is kind of its own story we'll probably touch on in a bit but when you look away above and way below that chain of dams you do see an appreciable effect generally somewhere in the one to two parts per million range which sounds like one to two parts per million is next to nothing but if you start to kind of use that concentration reduction and apply the amount of water that's flowing through these systems you start to arrive at a really appreciable removal from a load standpoint now um, that's kind of the next generation of data that we're going to be producing is that load data and we're, we're finding some pretty cool results of, yeah, so those days where we have those differences in concentration really are being driven by the process of the dam and the chain of dams themselves. So someone's curious here, is there a stream size limit to where beaver dams can be constructed? Yeah, so it's kind of a two-dimensional problem. Uh, in the state of Iowa, like Billy and I had said in the video, our streams are relatively in size, so they don't get any wider than the, the water district allows, for example. Uh, so really the limitation there is how tall the dam can be built. Uh, so the taller you get to increasing the stage, it's kind of an exponential problem where to get a foot taller, you have 10 times the amount of water pressing against that. Uh, now in areas again like Cat and Branch or state parks, for example, where that floodplain is really wide, we have some beaver dams that are two, 300 meters wide. So they're not only blocking the water in the channel, but the beavers are continuing their dam up in the floodplain to retain, uh, like the picture behind me and the picture behind Billy, acres of water, uh, sometimes five, six feet deep, uh, as far as you can walk in a given day for the most part. But uh, in, the, in the ag channels or the smelter farm, places like that, uh, they're very long pools because the slope is very gradual in those streams, uh, but they can't get much wider than the channel itself. They can't build all the way up to the floodplain. There'd just be too much power behind that water. So that's actually a really great segue because someone's curious how long, do, and I am too, how long does it take for a beaver to reconstruct and move once a dam has been destroyed? Yeah, so we have, we're, we're in the perfect spot to see this happen in real time this past year. Uh, I showed a picture of one of my students standing on a five plus foot dam. It blew out. Within about a week, they had already constructed an analogous replacement downstream. Uh, beavers are driven by 30 million years of evolution to build these dams. Uh, you play a speaker of water running out in the landscape, beavers will come pack it full of sticks and mud. It's kind of a fun little side. <laughs> if you guys are bored or have grandkids want to send them outside. Uh, but additionally, uh, they, they, they have to have this uh, in place. So if you've seen a beaver walk across the landscape or your cornfield, they're kind of like that. I call them the drunken sailor, right? They're, they're not very graceful. But as soon as they get in the water, they're free from predators. They're free from uh, any obstructions by people and, and the like. And they'll actually store meals and things. Uh, you'll see piles of sticks placed in the fall. They'll swim under the ice in the wintertime and eat them. So they're, they're happy in the water. Uh, so they want to create more and more dams if possible. And someone's curious, uh, do you have a link or place people can go to look at this data any closer? Are you at that point of publishing anything just yet? Yeah. So. Um, Getting into the, the beginning of the publication phase, uh, Billy and I maintain a presence on the Iowa, uh, INRC, the Iowa Nutrient Research Center's website. Uh, it's updated roughly every six months or so. I was actually just going to kind of check on that after this conversation here to make sure it's kind of up to date. Uh, there you'll find my email, various pictures of uh, progress along the way, some of the things that we've done for outreach and the like. But uh, I would anticipate uh, towards end of summer, really, is when the, the real numbers are going to start being generated. Um, otherwise, yeah, we're kind of still in that collection phase. We have one more season of uh, data to collect, and then I get the fun task of 
get all this stuff written up for <laughs> share with everybody. So I think a comment was made uh, in terms of, you know, call you first. Someone's curious, can beavers be relocated to a stream or farm if someone wanted them? Yeah, there are. So I can speak in my Iowa State researcher's hat and then my outside hat. Uh, there are certain limitations when it comes to our studies when we interact with animals. Um, but I know for a fact there are quite a few trappers, both commercial and just volunteer, that are willing to go out and relocate beavers. I have one of them. Beavers being a game animal are relatively unregulated. Now there is a trapping season for you know actually taking a beaver off the landscape. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, even in you know southern Iowa right now, there are bounties for beavers. So uh, people want to move them out of certain places and put them in other places. Uh, I did see a question that very related pop up uh, around, okay, I have a beaver in my area, but I don't want it to flood. We've actually experimented with a number of what are called beaver deceivers. And basically, like it sounds, you drill a pipe right through the dam, uh, usually a field tile, eight, 10 inches or so. Uh, hopefully put a cage on the top or else they'll plug that thing up. And it allows the water to pass through at a you know stable stage, even when it gets a decent rainfall, prevents flooding laterally. Uh, so sometimes people are are willing to at least allow the dam to stay in place if they can mitigate some of that flood risk. And the beavers are none the wiser generally. And maybe, maybe not, but are you familiar with, are you engaged with the beaver activity near the pond at the West Des Moines City Campus? So West Des Moines is just kind of off the Des Moines lobe. Uh, the primary focus of this study is on the Des Moines lobe landform. Uh, so think city of Des Moines, uh, if you go stand at the Capitol building and look south, that's why you can see so far you're on the edge of the Des Moines Lobe, all the way up to Okaboji and kind of past Mason City. Uh, we generally don't uh, transit into the state of Minnesota, uh, so we try to keep all of our work out there. But yes, I am familiar and I've heard from the city managers of West Des Moines. I live in Ankeny, so I get all kinds of uh, Des Moines metro beaver activity sent my way. And I've got a couple questions that have come in. Um, related to what impact may these beavers be doing to tile drainage? That's some of the complaints people have, or concerns people have heard sure. is that these dams would back up tile drainage. Yeah, I, I've i seen in some pretty limited cases, uh, generally it's happening in locations where the tile is at such a low gradient, it's not doing a good job of draining that landscape anyway. Um, so there, if you think about a beaver dam pool, in order for it to back up a tile line, which are generally sloped towards the stream, of course, it need to have a pretty significant, what we call head, or the pool has to be high enough to, for gravity to carry it back up the tube. Um, actually, so Chichaco Bottoms Greenbelt last year did some pretty significant studies there along the, the Skunk River by Bondurant uh, about this exact purpose. And they found that only one of their you know, 50 or 60 tile lines was backing up uh, because of beaver activity. And that again, was, it was almost dead flat. Uh, so if you follow kind of the principles of plumbing, you have enough you know, fall on your, on your tile line, uh, it should not be backing up into those. But of course, case by case basis, maybe beavers are seeing that water move out and they'll start plugging, plugging that tile hole. But generally speaking, I uh, haven't seen that as pronounced as it might be kind of uh, the narrative might, might make you think, I guess. Yeah, so, uh, so as a question here from someone who works with farmers, um, asking maybe this is a future research project potential but could a landowner submit a water sample of their own to compare upstream and downstream effects and are you potentially looking for any more sites and if yes what would the protocol be yeah so i'll handle the looking for sites first if you're on the des moines lobe absolutely if you're off the des moines lobe still send it to me i might i generally drive around iowa in hunting season and whatnot and check things out uh, but really for the study we, we're relegated to the des moines lobe uh, we don't really have a mechanism to like take outside water quality samples, but there are a number of places, both commercially and, and run by the state, that will take different types of water samples. Um, now, you, being a good scientist, you'd want to do that over time because there's some seasonality to all of this. But uh, of course, if anybody has uh, a beaver dam or they think they have a beaver dam or beaver activity on their landscape on the Des Moines Lobe, um, my email should be attached somewhere in the literature after this meeting. Uh, or, it was at the bottom of the screen, but might have gotten chopped off a bit. It's my first letter A, rupiper at iastate.edu. And we get emails from all over the place and send students to drive around and check out dams and 
if, they, so, if they're going to stay in place, we'll add them to the list and come you know, do some work on them. I know some of our interns last summer had the opportunity to, to yep. do that. So mm -hmm. they really enjoyed it. Uh, so you mentioned uh, that your passion is in beyond maybe just the beavers, but on fish, fisheries. So could you expand or comment on the fisheries impacts or benefits of beaver dams, including low oxygen in the pool, fish passage and migration? Yeah, this is a pretty common question. I, I try to kind of balance it with, you need to look at a beaver dam across an entire year. Um, so what I mean by that, in the springtime, a lot of beaver dams are just kind of speed bumps for the stream. The water is high enough from our snow melt and our spring rains. Fish have a pretty easy time transiting up and down the stream. When you get into those warmer summer months, it's kind of a balance, like they said, between that low oxygen condition doesn't drive productive fisheries, but generally the fish that are in these first, second order streams are going to be small anyway, so they, they can persist uh, pretty readily, you know, two, three inches of water sometimes. Um, we don't have a lot, we're not looking at, from a study standpoint at a lot of the uh, kind of fish impacts, but work that's been done outside of our lab uh, generally shows that they're either negligible or promoting some diversity. Um, they, the, the negligible part comes in, things like blue herons find these beaver pools and they're like, oh, this is a lo lovely buffet in the summertime, especially when the streams are low, uh, they can just eat pretty much everything in there. Uh, otters also occupy beaver dam pools, which can have a pretty heavy impact on, on some of the fisheries. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, we see an increase in diversity across mammals, fish, amphibians, reptiles uh, in these beaver dam pools, especially those things that are looking for some unique plants and uh, little habitats that are created by beavers. I'll add too, like in the drought periods, like last summer, they can act as important refugia for yeah. for animals. Like it's wild to go out there and there's no flow, <laughs> there's no water except in these pools, yep. and then there's abundant wildlife in there. So it was that was really neat. So yeah, at the Cat and Branch site, what, what's behind Billy there? We see tracks of uh, all kinds of muskrats, coyotes. Uh, we've had a whole bunch of deer. You know, things that just they need water in the in the summertime, and they come to these locations. And some of these dams have been around for 10, 20 years. The animals know that they're there as well, so they'll keep utilizing those uh, oases, if you will, in the middle of a dry summer. So speaking of time, there's been a few questions. Folks are curious, uh, phrased a few different ways, but um, what happens to beaver dams over the long term? How long does a family inhabit them? Like someone noted that they used to see them, but they don't need more. So how long do they stay there? How long do they live? Yeah, so beavers are rodents. They're big rats in some cases. Uh, they live somewhere on the order of 15. Some have been as old as 20, 25 years uh, in my experience. They have a pretty defined family dynamic. What I mean by that is mom and dad beaver have some pups. They allow them to live for about a year or two in their, their kind of familial group, and then they explicitly kick them out. They, may, they send them downstream. A lot of that is prevention of competing for resources, especially. Beavers need to eat a lot uh, and often, so they send their kids downstream after they've had a little bit of practice building a dam. So I, I compare two dam types, uh, what I call kind of the, the formal they figured it out. They're older beavers. They make these really strong dams that sometimes persist. Uh, from aerial imagery, I've seen some as old as 20, 25 years in Iowa. It's fairly rare. Of course, as soon as we started this, this project, we had some of those dams fail right in front of us, uh, but they're very quickly rebuilt in other places. Uh, they generally will rebuild in a given location if there's sub su sufficient uh, wood resources. Uh, so a lot of times they'll clear out a big area of willows and, and whatever trees were standing rather than rebuilding in this area that has no trees they'll move up or downstream a little bit to take advantage the nice thing about that is it lets those areas that were cleared out restore or grow back and things like willows grow really quickly so they will sometimes kind of navigate or migrate back and forth in a stream channel uh, but i would say they're from both a nutrient and sediment trapping as well as just persistence in the landscape. It's not a hundred years, it's definitely uh, kind of on that 10, 10 year uh, range. Now out west or in Canada, you have huge 400, 500, 600 meter dams that have been there for a really long time, but they're dealing with very different circumstances in their landscape. 
So question is, have you been able to monitor a dam following removal either by people or storms? Yeah, we had a, that, again, that was a perfect opportunity. I first started two summers ago. Uh, so we took some of those sediment measurements, did some calculations and went back out to get a second set of measurements and the dam had blown out. So we took advantage of that. We did the same sampling protocol on this area that's now a stream that's only you know three or four feet wide. Of course, we found as that dam broke, a lot of the sediment kind of went along with the water. Now, the nice thing about that location is there were some kind of pockets of heterogeneity or odd topography behind the beaver dam that traps some of that sediment in place. Uh, generally speaking though, as soon as the dam leaves, a lot of the nutrient trapping uh, is, is gone with it because the stream channel will go from this big pool right back to what it was. Uh, but Billy mentioned earlier, one of the really kind of lasting effects, even after the beaver are gone, even if the dam is broken, is it's moved the direction of that stream channel in some cases. And in other cases, they're entirely cutting off meanders uh, they're redirecting a stream from one way to the other uh, pretty efficiently. And there's a question here. You may need to explain what this acronym is because I am not familiar with it. But they are looking at using BDAs to attract beavers to areas for possible mitigation. What other things should we be looking at to show functional lift? Sediment and nutrients yeah. loads, obviously. Anything else? So BDAs, those beaver dam analogs that Billy touched on a bit. Um, I've seen them used to like basically give a foundation for dams to be built upon. If you know you have a beaver in an area, they're gonna build a dam. Like it's just, that's how they do. Uh, one of the ways a little more cost effectively, so the, the downside of the beaver dam analogs is they're not maintained. You have to go out, you as the person who installed them and maintain them. If you can get a beaver in your system there, they're just maintaining this thing nonstop. So it kind of takes your hands away from it. Uh, one of the locations that we tend to see beaver dams pop up in a given stream, especially those kind of what I'll call farm channelized streams, uh, is just the presence of large uh, either cobble or sometimes riprap material that falls into the stream. They really like that as a base to start building from. Uh, and that's kind of coupled with existing uh, practices of building those, those various rock features and streams. The beavers like them as well. It gives them a place to kind of start and hold on to. So there's a question here. Um, you're studying in the Des Moines Lobe, so North Central Iowa, and there's wondering if there's an existing database for beaver dam locations as a starting point to study the impacts if you think about to scale up your activities. And if not, are these dams identifiable through remote sensing image tools, or are you pretty much relying on folks giving you a call? So uh, to date, the database exists both in my head and an Excel spreadsheet <laughs> that my undergraduate students operate on. Um, really. This is a new activity. If you look at a lot of the literature, um, you know, some of the big review papers that get done and you look at the Midwest, it's blank. There's nothing happening. There's been a little bit of work in Nebraska, a little up in Minnesota, but pretty different landscapes there. There is uh, up and coming work out West. And it's been validated and proved to work out in Northern California, uh, kind of Southern Oregon, where they're using just that. They're using remote sensing to be able to not only perceive location, count uh, how long beaver dams have been in the landscape. Tricky bit in Iowa is you need some fairly high resolution imagery that we just don't happen to have available publicly. Um, so the, the group I was talking about is actually based out of Google where they can utilize some of the proprietary high resolution imagery that they produce. Uh, originally it was locating cul-de-sacs in, in people's uh, in neighborhoods and calling those beaver dams. Um, but I was able to submit them a couple hundred dams that I've identified uh, to hopefully integrate into their, their system and, and be able to churn me out a list of, of dams to visit. It's those types of collaborations that you, it was a random conference I was at uh, that, that we get really excited about because it goes from calling around to every DNR office, hey, do you have a beaver dam? And they get kind of annoyed to, hey, I can just push a button and hopefully get at least a you know 85% certainty of where a bunch of dams are. But we're always looking. I'll, I'll say that again, always looking for more dams. And I know Adam Jenke, our wildlife specialist for ISU Extension is with us. So I may give Andrew a break, although you can definitely chime in again. Uh, but someone has a question here. Have there been any noticeable changes in wildlife communities moving in or out of the areas where beaver dams are present? Well, to echo what Andrew has been saying very um, accurately throughout, there hasn't been a lot of research on this topic in the Midwest. And so 
um, like we don't, I don't know that I can like point you to the study that has documented, but intuitively what Andrew is describing and what's in the background of Andrew and Billy's pictures uh, and what we can just kind of say from our experience in these places is they create uh, novel and really important ecosystems. Um, I'm trying to think, I can't think, I don't think that there is a specific species of wildlife in Iowa that is like totally reliant on beaver dams, but there is certainly a broad suite of species, including many that are rare and declining, that benefit from beaver dams and associated riparian wetland ecosystems. And so, um, yeah, so lots of good accrues. I think that's all. I just echo what they've been saying all along. Lots of good accrues when you uh, introduce wetlands back into these landscapes. Yeah, there's kind of three examples that I always point to when people ask this type of question. Um, one happens to be a bird. We get sandhill cranes quite frequently at these beaver dam pools in the summertime. Now they're just taking advantage of the water resource as they're flying around and they see it in the landscape. Uh, we've had Blanding's turtles show up in a couple of these ponds uh, and then some regal fritillary butterflies, which they're all utilizing it either for some sort of water or salt resource, but uh, it's neat to, to be in you know farm fields on either side and this little critter pops up that's I spent years looking for my undergrad days that just swim around in a beaver dam pool. But yeah, it's like Adam said, I don't know that there's something uh, that has to have a beaver dam. Uh, if they did, they were gone in the early 1900s when the beavers were gone. Um, so we're just, uh, it's a feature in the landscape that's not present otherwise behind a dam. I'll add too, like just quickly, the, the impacts to riparian vegetation as well. I mean, obviously they eat. They don't eat, but they impact riparian vegetation. Well, they do eat. They eat part of it. But like um, they raise the riparian water table, especially in size systems, which we can see, you know, we go out there, Andrew and I and um, other folks, like you can see differences in that margin of the beaver dam pool versus the non-dammed reach. So a much uh, higher diversity of species. It's, it's really cool. So no numbers on that, but that's just a kind of an anecdote, so. And kind of a related question here, and maybe this is subjective, but do beaver dams affect flood risk positively, negatively? That's what you're trying to figure out? Yeah, so we, we don't look specifically at like flood risk from like a human neighborhood, if you will, standpoint. Um, of course, you know, if they're put in a bad place or whatever that might mean, next to a storm drain or adjacent to a highway, you can have some issues with flooding there. Now, that's kind of hearkening back to what Billy said earlier, where these probably have a place in the landscape, uh, not everywhere. Areas like Cat and Branch that when floods happen, it's OK because there's no infrastructure there. Um, they, they generally will attenuate that flood wave. But as things are changing in our landscape, uh, both kind of meteorologically and, and kind of the seasonality of some of our storms, they're probably not going to play a huge role in like, you know, attenuating the Mississippi Basin. But on a really local scale, uh, they can they can drive some slowing of that water, allowing it to have time to either uh, percolate into the ground uh, or just instead of directly ripping down the stream channel. And we've seen this a ton. Like, just look at the back behind Andrew and myself. It's, you know, meters of height difference in stage there. And that really works to connect the floodplain with the channel. And floodplains are superpowers we talk about beavers as superpowers and floodplains are superpowers with attenuating flood flow and uh long-term storage of, of things like phosphorus and sediment so um yeah like they like like we talked about stream banks um localized flooding may occur but in the big picture it's a good thing it could be a, a very good thing for the watershed as a whole so i'm sharing my screen again this uh it's a i just did this in like you know paint but that's the stream channel that blue line there uh, that's how water would normally transit through this landscape, put a beaver dam in place. And now all of a sudden there's this giant pool where that water is spreading out. When that water spreads out, a lot of the energy goes with it. So things are falling out of solution, the sediments and the like. It's getting down into the ground where it can be processed rather than just cutting straight through that channel. Um, so it's pretty amazing though, the volume of water behind some of these dams is, it's immense. It's, it's thousands and thousands of gallons if you think about it in those types of terms swimming pools, if you will. All right, well, there are so many questions. I'm gonna keep trying to power through as many of them sure. as we can. Uh, Billy, I'm gonna direct this one to you. Do beavers only eat cam tree Cambrian or do they have other dietary needs? So, or maybe Adam wants to jump onto that one too. I'll defer to Adam and Andrew on that one. But yeah, <laughs> they, they don't like, it's not like a, 
Looney Tunes where they're just eating the log. <laughs> so they eat the the cambium, the 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 outer, uh, the inner bark of the of the material. But I'll let I'll let these two folks uh, hit that. Um, well, Andrew's a beaver expert, but I mean, they, they, they're just, they're strict herbivores. And so they primarily eat the woody plant material. Also, Andrew mentioned this cool caching behavior that beavers do where they like pot, literally just make brush piles in the water and they come up under, you know, that all gets frozen. They come up underneath and eat that during the winter. So it's a, like a very hearty, uh, food cache that they eat, like the cambium of the, of the trees and branches and stuff. And that's, one of the reasons they're cutting down, you know, big trees sometimes is to access some of that fresh active growth. But during the rest of the year, they also eat like buds and leaves and twigs and all sorts of stuff. Anything, you know, they're, they're not eating like heartwood because there's just like no nutrition there, but any like sort of active, gro actively growing plant tissue, uh, they'll take advantage of that as a food source because they're, yeah, herbivorous and need to eat a lot. I've got a stick here that kind of shows. So they're just eating that tiny layer of cambium, that new growth as the branch expands. And they don't touch the stick itself, right? Uh, something that I find fascinating, my kids find kind of gross, is beaver, beavers are coprophagous. So they eat, they poop, and then they reheat it. They keep recycling that stuff. It's really difficult for their uh, digestive tract to extract all the nutrients out of this cambium. They don't have multiple stomachs like a cow, for example. So they just re-eat the little beaver nuggets uh, that you find in the landscape. Kind of gross to think about from our standpoint, but really they're, they're getting every last possible nutrient out of that stuff as they're, as they're churning through it. And we see them eat roots and leaves and all kinds of stuff throughout the year, but yeah, mostly sticking to that, that candy material. And Adam, I, I've got a related question. You sent me a message about like, what do you want to do if you want a beaver on your farm? And maybe Andrew knows this one too, but can you take a beaver across straight lines? I, I want to I want to discourage people from moving beavers, moving any animals. That's as a general rule, those things are um, um, precluded by state law. You'd have to be licensed to really handle any animal or any do any sort of translocation and things like that. Um, so I guess let no, please let's not. As a general rule, um, what if you if you want to have beavers on your property or on your farm, then start to look to understand the characteristics of the site. Like what is what is the nature of the stream that goes through? All of the things that Andrew and Billy have been teaching us, like what is the velocity of the stream? What's the permanency of the stream? What are the site characteristics and stuff? And then don't forget about the neighbors, like what's going on downstream is gonna have a really big impact on a beaver, which is capable of moving across land, but we, they're probably not making big movements across land. Um, of being able to find their way to your farm. Um, just as the best solution for the conflicts is to first try tolerance, the best solution for waiting for a beaver to show up would also be patience. Uh, letting these things naturally colonize. They are relatively ubiquitous in our state and they're increasing in their abundance. They're found in every county in the state. Um, and so, you know, as a general rule, they can find their ways in. Um, but yeah, I would, I would, I would look before I would go trying to move things around, which again, is just like a risky thing and we want to discourage people from doing that. Um, understand what's going on in the neighbors, have conversations with the neighbors um, about their relationship to beavers um, and see if, yeah, if you could find that, you know, sort of tolerance that would allow for their populations to establish in your neck of the woods. And are there any natural predators besides people for beavers? Yeah, a lot of, I mean, they're building these pools to avoid predators, right? In some cases, uh, predominantly coyotes in our state. Uh, we get, of course, little bobcats and things transiting through and relatively rare. Uh, but really, otters will have some interactions. They're not predating on beavers, but they'll kind of drive each other out of a given area. But really, it's the coyotes that they that they're tend to be predated by. And like many animals, earlier life stages are more vulnerable than later life stages. But yeah, um, so yeah, a few things predate them. Uh, uh, regulated hunting and trapping is a factor, um, but they have relatively high survival rates as adults. All right, I'm going to do two more questions and I need to share my screen again, and hopefully we'll have time for at least one or two more questions. Uh, maybe this will be a quick one. Uh, is it actually legal to blow up beaver, beaver dams? 
So I'll, I'll tune into this one. I'm a former explosive ordnance disposal technician from the military. So that was the first interaction I had with beaver dams in Iowa. It was down at Chocolate Mountain's Greenbelt to blow them up. Um, if you are licensed to carry a federal explosives permit, of which there are not very many in the state of Iowa, and you follow all of the prescribed uh, processes by the DNR, you're still in a waterway, so it becomes really difficult unless you're on land that's owned by the state and they've given you permission. I can't opine to what happened in the past uh, because there was a lot of that going on, but generally speaking, uh, modern beaver dam removal is done by excavator or just by hand. Uh, kind of, you get a break in the dam and water will take care of the rest for the most part. And then uh, one more final question here before I show my screen one more time, but do you anticipate that eventually developing some best management practices for beaver ponds as an edge of field practice? I think it, Billy can tune into this a little bit too, but I think it would be really cool to promote, not just get a beaver to my site, but also what trees do we plant? How close to the channel? How far do we need to keep our cornfield back before they start to eat it? Some of those things I've always thought about as I'm cruising around all these dams uh, would definitely, in my opinion, uh, they're analogous to like a crep wetland, right? Just on a much smaller scale. Uh, so they're, they're slowing the water down. They're allowing things to be processed like we've said a number of times today. Now, there's always hurdles to try to get things into that, you know, best management practice status, especially when you're dealing with a, you know, 50 pound rat that runs around and eats things. Um, it, it becomes a little more precarious, but uh, they rival some of the good practices and would complement them very well. I could see an outlet of a, a bioreactor dumping into a beaver dam pool, which is all sharing and wood resources in some way. It's my future hope, I suppose. Yeah, good point. And too, like these things are, they're not, they're not like fixed in place. They move around. They're very ephemeral, which is one of the biggest challenges and opportunities of this study is to study something that moves, disappears, comes back in a different spot, things like that. But for me as a forester, I'm really interested in kind of the recipe of riparian vegetation and management that we can have to encourage these creatures, but also not have them negatively impact our riparian vegetation. So we had one person that was a potential site that planted a very nice riparian buffer, which encouraged beavers to, to occupy the area, but then they were upset because the, the beavers were kind of um, quote decimating the, the vegetation. So getting that balance of getting them in there and making them happy, but not having them um, have uh, negative impacts to the system from the landowner perspective, I guess. So All right. the beaver buffer design, I guess. <laughs> so if you join today to get a CCA CEU, please email me. My email is there on the screen and I will put it in the chat momentarily. It's E-J-U-C-H-E-M-S at iastate.edu. Please send that by 5 p.m. today and I'll get your credit submitted. If you are interested in an edge of field practice like a bioreactor, saturated buffer, oxbow, or wetland, uh, please also email me. I can help connect you with our Iowa Department of Ag and Land Stewardship. And the final slide I wanna just share is uh, a voluntary USDA demographic survey. So we are grateful to receive their support and uh, this survey only needs to be completed once. So if you've already done it for previous virtual field day or for one of our webinars that you've attended, uh, no need to fill it out again, but you can simply scan this QR code on the screen or visit iowalearningfarms.org slash survey and you can complete that survey there. All right, so while I'm putting those emails and links in the chat, let's take one more question. And you kind of alluded to this, Billy, but there's a couple that have come in um, about species that could attract beavers and uh, what is the relationship between riparian reforestation and beaver dam success? So are there certain tree species that are more beneficial? I can't speak to like nutrient content beneficial, but and Andrew, is like probably the number one person in the state to discuss what they've been eating. But I personally have seen them eat almost anything and it's almost random. It's not like a human would go through and like start at the bank and work their way up. Uh, but I think they exhaust their preferred species initially and then move on to other things. But I've seen them eat everything from willows, which is their one of their preferred kind of ice cream foods here in Iowa, up to Eastern red cedar. So, um, but I'll, that's a really good question about, I've always heard as a forester, the anecdote that they won't eat sycamore because of their, of the, the characteristics of sycamore wood. But um, I'll let Andrew share his experiences from the across central Iowa's about that, so. Yeah, Billy touched on it pretty perfectly there where 
uh, you know, if, if we were leaving a stream and eating things, we'd start on the left and work our way across like a typewriter. They tend to say, okay, I want to eat my preferred species. I'm willing to walk a little bit further as a trade-off, right, to get that willow, and I'll go buy a couple oak trees. Um, there are some species they just don't touch. They tend to avoid some of the, the conifers. They have resins and things that aren't very tasty, uh, presumably to beavers. Uh, sycamore is one of those things that if you want to put a big tree relatively slow growing in your riparian buffer and you don't want beavers, they do not like it. I don't know if it's the texture of the, the wood structure that just doesn't seem to agree with their teeth. Uh, cottonwoods are another. Now they have their own drawbacks uh, from some people's standpoint, but uh, they grow quickly. Uh, it's really the key here is growing quickly. If you can get enough trees in the landscape that can outpace the beaver's ability to eat them, something's going to last. Uh, and I try to tell people to just mix it up. Uh, plant things close to the stream that you're okay with losing. And then as you get further away, if you've got a big old beautiful maple tree, it might take uh, you know installation of a temporary fence or something to dissuade the beavers uh, with some kind of mixed results. But they're, they're pretty... Uh, fastidious they'll they'll chew through chain link fence sometimes and if they're trying to get after something when they're hungry but uh, they're, they're pretty lazy in some instances so provide something close to the stream that's tasty and they'll tend to leave your your preferred uh, prized trees alone well thank you everyone for all of your great questions i know i didn't get a chance to get to all of them so again if you have a question i put it in the chat andrew's email it'll be in the video too so this is recorded it'll be uploaded to youtube here momentarily uh, so you can always refresh and, and follow up with folks and we look forward to seeing those results maybe even later this year um, as your data collection winds down and again thank you all for for joining us we did surpass 200 people. So thank you again and have a great afternoon.